So this week, we're going to be discussing the topic of multi-party computation. So what's multi-party computation? You already saw an example in the previous video, the example of Alice and Bob trying to compute the AND function. In this video, we're going to see another example, which is called oblivious transfer. Before discussing oblivious transfer, let me briefly review the general theory of multi-party computation. So what's the goal? In multi-party computation, also sometimes called secure function evaluation, there's a number of parties. For simplicity, we're going to focus on two parties, the usual suspects, Alice and Bob. And each of these parties has an input. Alex receives an X, Bob receives a Y, taken from some input set. You can think of them as just being bit strings. And their goal is for Alice to output a function fa, Bob to output a function fb of their inputs x and y by communicating. For the example of the AND function, we had fa equals fb equals the AND of the inputs, but you can think of any function you like. Now we'll say that the protocol for secure function evaluation is correct if whenever Alice and Bob follow the protocol, then their outputs are indeed equal to what the function is saying their output should be. So for the AND, the protocol is correct if both Alice and Bob always output the AND of their inputs when they follow the protocol. That's pretty straightforward, but now we want to set up some security requirements. And what are the security requirements? Well, informally, we want Alice and Bob to compute their functions in a way that leaks the least possible amount of information about each other's inputs. So security is defined in two steps for cheating Bob and cheating Alice. It's analogous in both cases. Let's look at cheating Bob. What we want is that if Alice is honest, meaning she behaves exactly as the protocol states that she should behave, then whatever Bob does, there is no way for him to learn any information about Alice's input X other than what he would have learned by running the protocol honestly, which is, well, at least he must learn whatever this function fb reveals about x, right? If fb of x and y would be equal to x always, this is an example we could consider, then by correctness, Bob must learn x. And in that case, we can't require of security that he wouldn't learn x, right? So Bob will always learn fb of x and y, and that's the only thing he should be able to learn about Alice's input. Symmetrically, um, if Bob is honest, then a cheating Alice cannot learn anything about his input y than what is already revealed by her output fa of x and y. So these are the security requirements. Now, are you satisfied? See, what I'm saying here is Bob learned nothing about x, and Alice learns nothing about y. But by now, you know that the notion of learning something about some input is not a very well-defined notion, and if you want your security definition to be useful, you really ought to make this definition more precise. And making it precise here is not easy at all. Let me give you the main idea. The idea is the so-called simulation paradigm. So the way we'll formulate security is like this. So if we imagined that uh, the protocol is running with Alice, who is following the protocol honestly. This is why I put her in blue. And then there's a Bob who's dishonest, trying to extract some information about X. So this dishonest Bob has the input Y, but then is producing some output G of X, Y, which you know, could be X, for instance, if Bob is successful in being fully dishonest or some other property of X. And we'd like to say that this ought to be impossible. How do we formulate it? The idea is to introduce something called the ideal functionality. The ideal functionality is some kind of an ideal box, doesn't need to exist, it's just meant for the proof, that does exactly what Honest Protocol should be doing. Meaning this ideal functionality takes inputs x and y, and it returns output fa of x, y, and fb of x, y. Without any communication, this is just a box that does what it's supposed to do. So you can, you know, there's no this is separated, it just magically does the exact right thing. And we'd want our protocol to look like this magic box. What does it mean? We want to say that whatever a dishonest Bob can do in a real implementation in the protocol, he could also do 
if instead of having access to Alice, he had access to the ideal box. But the ideal box being ideal, there's nothing really malicious he can do if he can only interface with the ideal box. And so then we'll say that the protocol is secure. Let's make this a little bit more precise. We want to say that whatever this honest Bob does, so if I put a little box here around him, well, this I can replicate in the ideal world using something called a simulator. The simulator is something that completely takes over Bob's part of the ideal functionality. So this is the simulator. It receives Bob's output Y and is to produce the same output as the dishonest Bob. So some G of X, Y. And in order to do this, the only thing the simulator can do is interact with the ideal functionality. Meaning it can choose to input Y or maybe it can choose to input some other Y, let's call it Y star. It can choose Y star depending on Y, whatever information it has. The ideal functionality by definition will output FB of X, Y star. And then based on FB of X, Y star, the simulator can do some computation, but it has to output something that looks exactly like the output of the dishonest Bob. Now, if we're able to show that for any dishonest Bob in our protocol, there exists a simulator that interacts with the ideal functionality and in doing though produces the exact same result as the dishonest Bob, then we'll say that the protocol is secure against the dishonest Bob. Because Bob could not possibly have learned anything from his interaction with Alice in the real protocol other than the output, because for the simulator, the ideal functionality is giving over to Bob is the ability to compute this output FB of X, Y star. So the only thing Bob can do is lie about his input, which is something that we'll never be able to prevent anyways. So that's the notion of security that we're going to work with. We're going to see some examples it's a very strong notion of security. It's necessary if you want protocols to be composable. If you want to use a secure protocol and another secure protocol and bundle them together into something that's secure, then you need something called universal composability and this definition achieves it. Unfortunately, as we're also going to see, it's so strong that it makes a lot of things impossible to achieve, at least with perfect security. So let's look about the example of oblivious transfer. So here's what oblivious transfer achieves. In oblivious transfer, Alice has two inputs, S0 and S1, and think of these as n-bit strings. Whereas Bob has a single input, and this input is just a single bit, y, in 0, 1. And the goal is that at the end of the protocol, Alice should obtain nothing. That's what this perp symbol means. And Bob should obtain one of Alice's two strings. Which one? The one that is indexed by his bit y. So this will be just one of Alice's string, it's an n-bit string. So if you think about it, what this means is that the perp symbol here for Alice means that she obtains no output, meaning she learns nothing. In particular, she doesn't learn anything about Bob's input, right? Because this doesn't depend on anything. So the first security requirement about oblivious transfer is that Alice doesn't learn anything. And now if you look at Bob's output, there's just one of Alice's strings here. So the way to interpret this requirement is that Bob should learn one of Alice's strings, the one that's indexed by his input, but not the other. There is no information about S1 if Bob's input was 0 and no information about S0 if his input was y equals 1. That's oblivious transfer. Alice can transfer over one of her two strings to Bob. She doesn't know which string Bob got to learn and Bob only gets to learn one of the two strings, but not both of them. Now, why would anyone care about such a primitive? Because it's so-called universal. And we're going to see this uh, very soon. If you can implement oblivious transfer, then you can implement any function uh, in two-party computation. For example, the AND function you can do. Unfortunately, OT is impossible to achieve perfectly using either classical communication or quantum communication. So we don't have it. I'm not going to show you the proof of impossibility, but we'll see a very similar proof for a different primitive called bit commitment in a subsequent video. Now, oblivious transfer is impossible to implement with unconditional security or so-called statistical security. You can implement though under computational assumptions. So for instance, the existence of one-way functions. And in that case, you can derive the whole of multi-party computation just from your implementation of oblivious transfer. That's why it's still a very studied primitive. It's useful to think about it. So how do you build arbitrary multi-party computation 
out of oblivious transfer. Let's look at the main idea behind this on an example. And my example will be the AND function. So suppose that you can do one out of two oblivious transfer. How do you implement an AND? Here's how you do it. We're going to do a distributed AND. So Alice gets an X, Bob gets a Y. Their goal is to compute the AND of X and Y in a distributed fashion, meaning that I want them to output bits, sigma and S, such that the parity of sigma and S is equal to the AND of their inputs, instead of just being the actual AND itself. I'm not going to explain why in the video, but this is what turns out to be the useful thing to implement if you want to realize an arbitrary computation. Think of this sigma and this s as shares, secret shares of the desired output x and y. So it's like a distributed form of computation. Okay, so how do they do it? At the first step, Alice does nothing. Bob looks at his y and decomposes it in two random shares. So a will be a random bit in 0, 1, and b is chosen so that the parity of a and b is equal to y. So he sends a over to Alice. At the second step, they're going to use their oblivious transfer box. The way they do it, so look at um, Alice's side. It's a tiny bit complicated, but look at this here, x and a plus b. So if Alice knew b, she would know both shares of Bob's input. So a plus b would be equal to y. And so this would be exactly what they want to compute, x and y. Of course, she doesn't know b. So instead, she prepares two bits s0 and s1, which are taken as the parity of what the and would be if b was 0 or 1. And she takes the x with a random bit sigma to hide this output. So that's Alice's two strings, s0 and s1. Bob, on his side of the box, simply inputs his uh, bit b. 1, 2, ot does its job, meaning Alice doesn't get anything out. And Bob gets sb, either s0 or s1, depending on b. Bob outputs SB directly mm -hmm. as his output, and Alice, she outputs sigma. All right, to understand why this works, let's first see that it's correct. Well, by definition, sigma plus Bob's output is equal to sigma plus SB. Now, what is SB by definition? It's sigma plus X and A plus B, all right? The sigmas cancel out, and a plus b by Bob's choice is equal to y, so we get x and y. Okay, correctness works as long as the parties follow the protocol. How about security? Let me not argue it formally. Security against a cheating Alice is easy to verify, because what does Alice get? She gets a, which is chosen uniformly at random by Bob, right? So Bob is honest, Alice dishonest right now. She gets A, and the other thing she gets is from the 1, 2, OT is, well, nothing, you know, this perp symbol. So the only thing she gets are a random bit and a fixed symbol, so she gets no information at all about Bob. So the protocol is secure against cheating Alice. How about cheating Bob? What does Bob get from Alice? Nothing, nothing, nothing. He gets this string S here, that he gets to choose, because the cheating Bob could input any b he wants in this ot box. So he gets to learn either s0 or s1, one of the two, he can choose which. But what are this s0 and s1? They have some information about Alice's input here, except honest Alice took parity with a random bit sigma. So in fact, both s0 and s1 individually are uniformly random. And so Bob here gets to learn a uniformly random bit independent of Alice's input, as long as he only learns one of her two strings, the protocol is secure from his point of view. So protocol is also secure against cheating Bob. So that's it. If you can do OT, you can do the AND, and using similar idea, you can compute any multi-party function securely.